Hey everyone, I'm Chef Dennis, and welcome to Around the Kitchen Table with my co-host, Susan Sarah. How you doing, Susan? I'm doing great, Chef. I'm doing great. Um, I, I'm loving our colors. They're complimentary. You have the carrots there, which complement my glasses and my scarf. And of course, blue is a complimentary color, so you're looking awesome. Yeah, we're, we're looking a little... <laughs> A little Denverish today with the blue and orange. So. Uh, oh, true. Okay, yeah, you, you have to remind me of that. That's okay. Except it reminds me of the when I went to uh, Vegas in January to the kitchen show, and it was the same uh, Super Bowl weekend, mm -hmm. and I said, okay, well, let me place a bet because my son-in-law is a big um, Broncos fan. So you know, place the bet, hundred bucks, sure, no problem promptly lost it so you know that's my story about blue and orange I'm telling you I think that surprised a lot of people no one works nobody was yeah. Peyton Manning to go down like that but I wouldn't count them out this year I think they're uh, they're gonna be kicking some butt this year too my yeah. course Cowboys, on the other hand don't stand a chance in hell as long as Jerry Jones owns them but uh it's okay fun. yeah now you're talking over my head but I have to I do have to do one more shout out and that is blue and orange for Syracuse yes Syracuse. so go Cuse which is my uh, son-in-law's alma mater and obsession and I will tell you when he first started dating my daughter and we brought him over and I guess for fun you know it was a big game the big game I went we went out and we got all kinds of foods that were either blue or orange and and both blue and orange and so we had a whole blue and orange spread I mean you know there's not a whole lot of blue foods but we found them so that's, that's, a, that's a memory that's good well that's the they have the orange men too aren't they the, the Syracuse is that yes the oh my gosh yeah and the, and the basketball they were awesome last year I think they were in the finals last year if I'm not mistaken so uh, shout out to Cuse fans there you go okay let's do a few shout outs out in the uh, audience today and we have Carmen Mandich is in there. Hi, Carmen. It's always nice to see you. Where'd you, where'd, where'd you go? Yeah, always. Lovely to see Carmen. All right, why am I not? Are you, oh, Nazim's in the house. Mine are not working. Your comment tracker? Yeah. No. Well, it's up, but it won't let me pull them up. Oh, all right. Well, you work on it, and I'll go, I'll go down the list, Nazim. Okay. Say hi happy, to, to, happy to see you. He says, go Dolphins. Ha, there you go. Different blue, Nazim. That's right. That's right. Uh, Suzanne Baracchini, Baracchini, tuned in and ready to learn. Uh, let me tell you, I am too. And, uh, of course, I pick out colors, you know, to talk about, but it's about the food. Mm -hmm. uh, Carmen, we have, oh, we have candy. Um, Sakai, okay. Yep. yep. Yep, and Candy Tokyo Candy uh, got up special for this. She's oh yes, she on. did. And we're actually going to be doing a show with Candy. Me and I are going to be. She's going to be taking us to a um, a uh, big department store in Tokyo next. Not this Saturday coming up, but the following Saturday our time. And it's gonna, we're going to be doing it at night so we can get the times right. And she's going to be showing us some Japanese food uh, in one of their big department stores. You know how they have these big. Um, uh, they used to have them a lot in the U.S. They don't have them as more than the, I, I want to say you know, auto mats or what, what did we used to call them? Yeah. Remember those where they had all every food under the sun down in their basement? Uh, oh my after. gosh. They still have them there, so she's going to take us on a tour of Tokyo. So hi, Candy. Good to see you. Yeah. So and as he asked if we're doing conch chowder, uh, yeah. I don't think today. We're doing something close, but it's not conch, but it could be made conch chowder. And we're not doing conch chowder mostly because I don't like conch. Sorry. Oh, oh <laughs> okay. I had this beautiful, beautiful snail dish, the what escargot yes. in uh, France. Yes, and I, and, I, and I take the shells home. So, yep, very cool. De beautiful decorative piece for the kitchen. So what are we doing today, Chef? Well, today, you know, it's... it's um, Almost, it's not quite fall, but for me, living in the Northeast, Labor Day was always the day that signaled the end of fall, the end of summer, because all the shoebies went home. They packed up when I was living on the shore, and uh, they 
just the city would be ours again. It would be empty. It would be ours. And that also meant the weather was starting to get cooler. The nights were getting longer. The day was getting shorter. So one thing that I always think of when fall starts to hit are soups. And, you know, they're great in the summertime, but honestly, you know, when it's too hot out, I don't think about soup too much, even cold soups. It's, it's just not something that I really enjoy that much. So uh, cold soups don't make their way on my table too often, and hot soups, it's just I don't want to heat the kitchen up anymore. But now, fall's coming, a lot of good vegetables are in the markets, got a lot of great winter vegetables coming up that you can make soups out of. So I just want to go over some tips, you know, and some of it is um, prep and how to do prep work and how to get your knife skills a little, a little better so that it doesn't take as long and maybe some ideas on how to make it from taking, keep it from taking so long. Yeah, and I, I have some questions for you, absolutely, about soups. And I just had one. I, we went out to dinner Friday or Saturday night, and I had a potato, bacon, gorgonzola, cream soup, which was the special that evening. I mean, I could only eat, I couldn't even eat half of it, but I had to taste it. Sometimes I order things, and I know I'll only be tasting it a little bit. I mean, imagine that, potato, bacon, gorgonzola cream. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yep. So almost when you think about it, it was almost a baked potato soup, you know, yeah. a loaded baked potato soup. And right. List on it. So it's thinking that way a lot of times. It can give you ideas. But we're going to start, and with any soup, we always start with the holy trinity of vegetables. Every, every soup I make, with exception of usually cream soups, unless they're chowders, start with celery, onions, and carrots. And people always, you know, I've watched people cut vegetables and sometimes it's it's like a, uh, it's, it's not a good thing to watch them cut. So I don't know if we can see this properly or not. I'm just going to rearrange a little bit. So I, can I mean, yeah, it's it's looks great from where I sit. Okay, here we go. I wasn't sure if it was all coming in, the lower third, or the uh, film strip was blocking a little, so I wasn't sure. All right, so carrots. Carrots are very easy, very colorful. It's a great way to get things in your soup. So one thing you want to do is peel your carrot, wash your carrot. Uh, there's certain vegetables that I will always buy organic. There's certain vegetables I don't always have to. Carrots are one of the ones I buy organic because when you think about it, it's in the ground. Things that are in the ground, you really want to be a little more careful. And if you go to places like BJ's, just started carrying an incredible line of organic vegetables. You know, compared to uh, regular vegetables at a supermarket, probably about the same cost. So look for where you can buy. Them. But carrots are one of them. Potatoes are the other one. Um, you want to look for certain vegetables that you want to try and buy organic. So you you peel it, you wash it, you peel it, you cut each end off. Now, if I was still in a in a production kitchen. And, or if you make your own stocks, save these pieces. Or if you roast meats, save these pieces. Get a Ziploc bag, throw them in there, throw them in the freezer. When you want to go make stock or you want to roast a piece of meat, then you can put out all your scraps and you can put them in the bottom of the pan or you can put them in a pot to make your vegetable stock with. Oh, so, my gosh. That is like, oh. that's life-changing. Okay, so don't, so throw, easy to do. don't throw them away. So when you're cutting... Simple rules. All right, I'm right-handed. Knife's going in my right hand, so I'm going to hold with my left. Now, when I go to cut this carrot, carrots wobble. You know, it's, it's a fact of life. So whenever I get anything that's got a bigger end or it's going to be more hard, it's going to be more difficult to cut, I always start at the thicker end. Now, I grab either side of what I'm going to cut, all right, and then I take my knife into the deep end, so it's sitting in there like this. So then I can force it down a little bit, and then I can guide it down the rest of the carrot to split it. Now, sometimes you get these humongous potatoes or squash that are hard to cut. Same philosophy. Start and cut gradual. Work your way down. You don't have to slice right through it or chop it. And you know what I look forward to as we go along in, in the fall is parsnips drive me crazy. Oh because they are so big and one end and so tiny at the other end. So I'm sure we'll hit that later. Same, same kind of thing. You know, if you're going to peel them, you know, first you want to cut them and, and get um, all the insides out if there's anything inside. And then just you work always work on the big end first. You can cut them, cut them off in half, too, so you have, 
you don't have to work with things as precariously. So here we have them. First thing we do is turn them over so they don't wobble anymore. All right, then these, these are for soup. So I'm, I'm going to make kind of a rough cut. It's not going to be a big dice. It's going to be more of a medium dice. I could do a fine dice, and if I was going to do a fine dice, I would just try and cut these a little thinner. But I'm not going to do that, so I'm just going to cut them a little bit. Now, that's a little thick. I might take that down a little bit. So once you see where they are, depending on what you're making, a soup, you want bite-sized, nice, small bite-sized pieces. This was a stew. I'd cut them a little differently on angles and make them a little chunkier because I'm going to cook it a little bit longer, too, and they're going to get soft. This, so, is, this is so great to have the step-by-step. -step. I, I never knew about really prepping carrots, you know, in that way, but it makes perfect sense. So now I have two carrots cut. What I do is then I'm going to pull them together, and I'm going to hold with my left hand because I'm right-handed. I'm going to pull them in here, and then I'm going to put the tip of the blade down, and I'm, all I'm going to do is pick up the heel of the knife and cut. Tip is staying down. And as I cut, I'm taking this hand and I'm moving it back and pushing the carrots forward a little bit. I stop. It always scares me to death when I see this technique that the knuckles are going to be. Well, this was the knife. Here's where the knife's going. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Okay, That's so, so I helpful. can't cut myself. If I do this, I'm going to cut, but I'm curling my knuckles in. Wow. Like, so this is a guide. Now, granted, every now and then, and it's usually when someone says, yo, chef, and I turn around, I'll cut ah, a little bit off yeah. my finger. All right? But as long as you concentrate, this is your guide. That's so helpful. And as they get smaller, you know, cut. Now, if, if they're not small enough for you, pull them in, take your knife, point down, just like we would cut spices, do the same thing. And you can make them smaller. So you can cut them that way once they're that size, as small as you want. Wow. Now generally, I don't do a real small dice unless I'm doing a salad, like a chicken salad, a tuna salad, something that I'm going to eat or, or mix together with the meat. But for soups, that's a nice size cut. Okay, celery, same thing. You wash it, you take off the ends, throw them in your Ziploc bag, whatever you're making, and then pop them in the freezer. You want to cut both ends off. I already did this end. And then we're just going to go right down the rib. Now, this I don't turn over. You can, but I'm just used to cutting it this way because it's, it's almost like a little cup, so I don't worry about it as much. And then again, depending, it doesn't have to be straight lines. We're not at the CIA, at the Color Institute. <laughs> Jeff's not going to come over with his tape measure and make sure all your cuts are the exactly <laughs> same size. So don't worry about that. Again, pull them together. Hold your finger. Now I could do maybe two more stalks. Start out with two, add three, add four. And this is what will help you get your time down. So same thing. I'm keeping this down. Now, why do we not pick it up? Because you're going to get tired. First of all, we're not chopping. And the more I lift my arm, the more oh. I get. So I'm going to keep the point down. And all I'm doing then is I'm pivoting. All right? That's all I'm doing is I'm pivoting. As long as your knife is sharp, you'll cut all the way through some things. When you don't have a really sharp knife, that's when you have problems because you're not cutting all the way through. You know, so. Chef, you just went through two basic uh, sort of movements or technique. One is how to hold your uh, hand, you know, to guide the uh, knife, and the other one is ex precisely how to hold the knife and why. And th those are two things that look so simple, but the, the reasons behind it you know, I never really knew, and um, it's really helpful. But you got to think. Generally, if I'm in a kitchen, <clears throat> I'm not cutting two stalks or four stalks of celery. I'm going to be cutting down a case of celery or a half a case of celery or a half a case. Or I'm going to peel a 50-pound bag of carrots, put them in water, and then take them out and cut them as I need them. You know, things that we would do. Like if you want to 
peel your carrots ahead of time. Like say, I'm going to cut them tomorrow. I, I want to cut some of the work out. Let me peel them. I'll peel them. So I put them in a Tupperware container, fill it with some water so they're sitting in water, and then I can take them out and cut them when I have time. All right, that's another time saver. Do the same thing with celery. Just keep them wet after you cut them. Now, the other time saver is, all right, let's say you want to have some, make a little adventure out of it. Uh, it's We have some time on Saturday. Or we got a good buy at the market on celery and carrots. So I'm going to dice up a Ziploc bag full. Or I'm going to dice up, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put them all in one big one because they're going to freeze in a clump. I can break it apart. Yeah. I'm going to put them in small ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut carrots, onions, and celery to make a soup. And then I'm going to put them in small Ziplocs and freeze them. So the next time I want to make a soup, I pull out my mirepoix from the freezer, put it in a pot, and let it start. I don't have to cut vegetables. So you cut vegetables once, maybe for the next couple weeks. Wow. Okay, so time saving because you know once you get the stuff out and once you get the the, the pattern down, and when the more you practice, the faster you're going to get. So it's yeah. going to fly by. Now same thing with the onion. All right, onion. We're going to take off each end. So which which brings the question to me: Do you ever use a food processor to chop? I mean, personally, they they get too small. I think when the food processor, like a Cuisinart, don't don't you think? You can. Uh, they do. I would have to be doing massive amounts of them uh, to make it worthwhile. Okay. Um, th there's a lot to be said for the therapy of holding a knife and cutting, too. And you might find that mere act of doing that therapeutic and it just it connects you more with the food. Using, I mean, I, I love machinery and I will use it for certain things. Uh, but if I'm doing small amounts, and even for me, this would be if I was doing enough to freeze for three or four batches, I would probably still cut it all by hand. But if you want to do that much, and you have a good Cuisinart that has some small, but not too small dices, you, by all means, use it. Yeah. You know, if, it, if it makes your life easier and it makes you happier as a cook, do it. Mm -hmm. It's all about you. It's not about me. It's about what you like and what works for you. So, you know, that being said, go for it. Now, with onions, you see I cut each end off, and then I'm going to just take the skin off. And if there's any black marks, you know, I might wash it off a little bit more. Uh, and, again, you know, if you can find organic onions, onions are the one of the hardest things I have had to find organic. You know, I just got some purple onions from the farmer's market, um, that were that were grown on the east end of Long Island just yesterday in Sunday's Farmer's Market. I didn't know what I would use them for, but I thought I, I have to get them. Any Anytime, you know, it doesn't matter what color they are. It's, it's just appearance, and you can use them in a soup, you can use them. I, I tend not to use them in cream soups, just only because you can see them, but that doesn't mean you can't. Now, again, these skins, they would go in my Ziploc with the rest of my vegetable scraps, the peels from when I peeled the carrot, these, any other vegetables that I cut off, I trimmed. If you want to make a vegetable stock, you know, save, save yourself up a good gallon-sized bag of scraps if you have room in your freezer. And when it's time to make stock, you make stock. Now, onions are a little bit different in cutting. And you will notice when I do things, I'll tend to dry the board off a little because you don't want to slip. You want anything slipping anymore. And if you look and see the blue cloth under my cutting board, that's to keep my cutting board from moving. You can use a wet paper towel, another handy wipe, anything like that, and then that keeps it from sliding around because you want to be safe when you're cutting. Now, with an onion, there's a couple different ways you can cut. I can show you how to make a small dice. You know, it's, it gets a little tedious for me, so I don't do that anymore. But I just take them, and again, my fingers are my guide, and I start to slice. I just don't quite slice all the way through. Now this, if I was going all the way through, for whatever reason, is called an oriental cut. Oh my gosh, my mind is exploding. My head was, is exploding. And if I was going to make French onion soup, that's the kind of cut I would make all the way through to do them. All right, now, I was taught one time that if you come in here and if you make slices, do pretty much the same thing and make slices this way. that now 
when I cut it, it's diced. Oh my goodness, I, I need to pay you for this tip. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's all well and good, and I used to do it in my younger days. Wow. Day, but I find that I, I like them a little smaller sometimes, so I don't do the second cut. I do slice them through, though, and then I just cut them down this way. There's not quite the same kind of dice, but I can pull them in here and just cut to my heart's content. And, I mean, I have to tell you, for 40 years, I have been slicing onions all the way through the first time around, the first cut, slicing them all around, and they, they, then they scatter everywhere. So just so, not wow. Not quite. That's all. Just not quite. Just enough to make your life easier. So now I have my mirepoix: celery, carrots, onions, the holy trinity for for any soup, or if you were going to make a sauce and we strained it out, we didn't keep it in it, but still to add the flavor to it. If it was a Cajun holy trinity, it would be, it would be celery, onions, and peppers. We would leave the carrots out. So that's the, that's the one difference in that. So this is what I have to start with. All right, now I'm going to make, it's really easy to make soups now because you can make a stock soup or you can make a cream soup. We're going to start them pretty much both the same way. Now, if this was just a straight stock soup, I would start with oil. Okay, and I still can add a little oil in there, but I'm also going to add some butter in because I'm going to make a roux because I'm going to show you how to make a cream soup too. So we're just going to start very simply half of these. Now, if, uh, like I told you before, with anything extra you have, you put it in a Ziploc bag, and then next time you go to make soup, you know, you're halfway there already. I want to tell you one other tip, too, while this is cooking. All right, we have dinner. We all make dinners. Maybe not every night, but we make them. We try to eat our vegetables. It's one of the important things for us to do. And there's always a little bit of vegetable left over. You put it in a bowl, you wrap it up, you put it in the refrigerator, hoping someone will eat it. Reality is, it rarely gets eaten. It gets thrown out three days later, uh, and that's the end of it. All right, so now, let's face facts. You're not going <laughs> to eat that vegetable. Get yourself another Ziploc bag. Throw all your leftover vegetables in there. Freeze them. Get enough, make vegetable soup. Wow. So start this out. Even if you have some little scraps of like roast beef that you know are going to dry up and get thrown out, little scraps of turkey, scraps of chicken, put them in another bag, keep them separate. Unless you want to blend the meats, that's fine too. And you know that can make your soup. If you have leftover rice, if you have leftover mashed potatoes, mashed potatoes are great thickeners for soups. Wow, preach it, chef, preach okay. it. I feel, I feel like I'm in cooking therapy today. This is like, this is really... Well, you know, in the old days... Good stuff. What were soups? Soups you made from yeah. whatever you had left over. Okay, it's just that we've, we've made soup into an art form, so we make soup from all fresh ingredients now. Uh, it's just the way it is, but... You know, for years, and even back in the school, you know, what do I have in the walk-in? All right, I got some Spanish rice. I'm going to make a spicy Mexican-style chicken and rice soup. You know, I have mashed potatoes. All right, I'm going to throw some cheese in there, and I'm going to make a little bit of, like, a creamy potato soup. And it's funny, the only one that I ever knew it was was one of, one of my bosses. says, you, you use mashed potatoes for this, didn't you? I said, yeah. Huh. But most yeah. of the time, they can't tell. Yeah. That's, see, that's, that's really what I wanted to know, too, because, you know, you can get so caught up with following a recipe word for word and line by line and, you know, and go out and get those particular spices and that particular type of onion. But in the end, you know, th there are substitutions that can be made. Oh, absolutely. Now I'm putting a little salt and pepper on them. And what I'm, I'm doing now is called sweating my vegetables. And sweating the vegetables is bringing some of the liquid out of them. You don't ever want to just throw these into water and boil them for your soup base. It's all right to take all those ones that are already cooked that you're saving in the freezer. But these are raw vegetables. And boiling vegetables is not a good way to make soup. You want to saute them in a little oil or butter first. So now, if this was going to be a broth soup, 
I would simply get my chicken broth, my vegetable broth, and, and I buy at, at the big box stores, I buy soup bases. And this is a vegetable base. This is Miner's. It's one of the better ones. It's a paste. But you can also buy uh, quart containers. They sell of almost every kind of base that you could use for a soup at the grocery store. They have vegetable stocks. They have uh, chicken stocks, beef stocks. So it makes it easy. So at this point, now that my vegetables are sweated, I would pour in the stock. Okay, now my soup and it's going to stop it from cooking a little bit. It's going to start to boil. Now, depending upon what direction you wanted to take it in, if I'm just making chicken noodle, I may have put the chicken in here first, too, and then put the stock in, the chicken stock in. If I'm making rice and I'm using raw rice, I would put the rice in as it was cooking. Noodles I put in right at the very end because they tend to get really big and funky and swell up. So Yes, that's true. But now, let me ask you a question. Um, Carrots are so dense, so uh, you know. Does that does is, is there does that make a difference with the softer onions and the softer celery? You know, they're so they're so dense. Not really, and and because they're going to cook more. The soup is not going to just be done. And I, I forgot my potato, so I want to do that real quick too. And I'm going to make a chowder, so I'm going to show you a potato. I'm going to cut it in half first because it wobbles and I don't want to cut my fingers. I'm going to turn it over. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to slice it all the way through this way. All right, so I can do it standing up or I can just change it. So now I have three little slices. Now, I didn't peel these because they're organic. If they weren't organic, I probably would have peeled them. All right, so now that I have three little piles, I'm going to cut some strips. Then I'm going to turn it the other way. And now I have some nice diced potatoes. Okay, if I'm doing a stew and I want them bigger, I just don't make the cuts quite as small. So let me throw these in. And actually, the potatoes could have gone in right away. Your potatoes are tricky. They're they're very tricky to uh, cook, don't you think? They are, and you know I like to sweat them a little bit too. It's not quite as necessary. Now, I'm going to start my cream soup. Now, you could have made a red chatter, like I said, if you had cooked these and we were a potato soup and you just want vegetables in it, that's fine, too. Uh, if you have roasted potatoes that you do in the oven, you can save them for your soup as well. I'm put some butter in here because I'm going to make a roux right now. And I know we're running a little over time, you guys. I hope you forgive us. It's a soup, sir. There's a lot to them. If you have to come back later and watch it on replay, I understand. But I'm almost done, actually, too. Really not far. So you notice I didn't use my fingers today on the butter. I was watching for that. I'm disappointed. Well, you know, saute, I use my fingers. Soups, I actually cut them or spoon them. <laughs> it, it's a strange, I'm a strange person. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, now I'm melting my butter in here. Potatoes are in. They're going to get a little sweated, too. And you'll notice there's a little bit of brown in the bottom of the pan. That's flavor, you know, too. That's going to come up a little bit. You don't want it to burn, but that's a nice caramelization. So when I hit it with the stock, then it's going to start to come up. So I'm put in just a little bit more butter. Now, if you don't want to use butter, you can make a roux out of just oil. French will just die if you tell them you're doing that or any... Cajun cook will probably die if you tell me doing that. But you can make it with oil. I have not tried it with vegan butters, so I don't know uh, if you can. I mean, your dairy changes that you can use are really easy if you want to not use dairy for cream soups. And I really don't use much dairy in mine, but you can use different soy milks or almond milks or whatever you like to use. You know what I was wondering? Um Chef, Landa Lakes makes a fat-free half and half. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that as a thickener, as a substitute for cream? Oh, you'll see I'm not using a whole lot. Uh, you can use that if you want to keep it, uh, keep it down a little bit, but you're not going to add the flavor. And flavor comes from fat, unfortunately. So uh -huh. it's going to be, you could try it, but I mean, 
it, it's you know if you were going to use skim milk anyway, try it. You know, as long as it's fat free, but you're not going to get as much flavor, and it's not going to change the texture the same way. So now I'm going to add in a little flour. And the rule of thumb on flour is when you're making a roux is you want to take most of the shine off of the butter. You know, if I was making a gallon, a big pot, it would be a pound of butter, a pound of flour, a gallon of milk, or a gallon of the bus stock kind of a thing. Okay, and, the, and we have a question from Susanna, um, forgive me, Kawai. Uh, chef, do you always buy organic produce, organic vegetables, fruits, and organic meat? What produces do you recommend we buy organic? Good question. Well, you want to buy anything that grows in the ground is your first big thing. Anything with a thin skin is also a good choice. Berries, if you can buy them organic, are good things to buy organic. Something like a banana, you don't really have to because it's got such a thick skin. There's actually a list of the dirty dozen, uh, I think, of the vegetables that you really need to avoid. You need to buy organic. And if you Google that, you'll see what's what's recommended and what changes. Uh, mushrooms, I think, are on the clean 15, and uh, because of how they're grown, they really never see anything bad. But uh, I, I try to buy them whenever I can. In all honesty, you know, sometimes it's price. I try to buy my meats uh, either organic or um, free range whenever I can because they taste better. Honestly, that's why. All right, now, moving on to the next step is the stock. And when you're doing a cream soup, now you want to let this cook a little. But you have to be careful that it doesn't burn. Otherwise, your roux, and this, is, this roux is actually getting a little dark. It's gone from a blonde roux so the darker roux, and for cream soup, you really want it to be more of a light blonde roux, so you have to watch. It looks savory. It looks like so savory. Okay, now what I did was I, I took an ear of corn, I cut all the corn off, I threw a cob in the water, and I boiled it, because I'm going to make a corn chowder. So I just pulled the cob out of here. Now I'm going to add this hot stock. And I'm going to try and hold back most of the corn, but I'm going to, if some falls in, it's not a big deal. But I'm going to put my hot stock, and this is where the stock really needs to be hot. It can't be cold because you'll have problems. But I'm going to put my hot stock in here, turn this up a little bit more, and it's going to start to look a little like mashed potatoes. Yeah. Okay. There's such an art, and this is so helpful step by step. There's such an art. Okay, now, once we get it to this stage, and cooking a roux uh, on how to cook it, you want it to smell, start to smell a little bit like baking bread, and that's when you know the flour is cooking. So now that I've got it to this stage, and it's actually, we didn't have all those vegetables in it, it would be called a velouté, uh, and if you were making it without the vegetables, you could make a cheese sauce, you could make a mushroom sauce, you could make turkey gravy, whatever you're making, but this is how we make our cream soups. And if I had put broccoli in, if I had a, a pot of broccoli cooking, a pot of spinach cooking with the water, whatever vegetable you like at that point. So now I'm going to add in more liquid, and I'm going to add in my corn that came into the pan too. Now, when you're learning this at first, do it in a little bit smaller batches. I've been doing this a long time, so I could even do it with cold water, but it's not recommended especially if you're not sure from looks. So a lot of it has to do with how it looks as it's thickening. It's looking good from okay. where I sit. It's looking now great. We have a little bit of a corn, very thick corn chowder. Now I'm going to add a little bit of thyme in here. I haven't tasted it yet, but I'm going to do that. So now this is basically done. I have not added any dairy other than the butter into it. No milk products. This is your creamy soup. All right, it's a little thick now, and it will thicken more. So what you want to do is you just want to add more stock into it. Now, you saw I had the vegetable stock. This would be where you would put your vegetable stock in and taste it to make sure it's not getting too salty. 
but add your stock in and watch it. Keep it on low, let it simmer, and as it cooks and thickens, you can thin it out a little bit more. When it sits in your refrigerator, it's going to thicken some more too, so just be aware of that. And, and when, now, do you, when do you add the salt? I didn't see you add salt. I put salt in the vegetables. Okay, I, I must have missed that. I, I sprinkle them with a little salt and a little pepper when the veggies were sweating. So now is when I add my cream. That's it. Okay? Wow. That's not, that's, huh. Okay. So. That's not about a quarter cup, a third of a cup? Maybe a half at the tops. Okay. All right. And I'm going to add a little more stock in this as it sits because it's going to be really too thick. But all I'm doing is I'm changing the color and I'm changing a little bit of the mouth texture when I'm eating it. It's smoothed out now. And that's all I really need. When I would make a five gallon pot, I would use one of these. So how much cream is really in there? Of course, I probably use three pounds of butter too, but we won't talk about that. That's but interesting. Just, That's so interesting, Chef, because when you hear of, of cream soups, I have always assumed that there's a ton of cream in it. You can. The problem with a ton of cream in your soups, I'm just going to turn this off and come back to here. The problem with adding a lot of cream in your soups is you'll start to get this flavor, this gummy kind of sensation and flavor in your mouth when you're eating. You know, you think, wow, the more cream I use, the richer and better the soup is going to be. And that's not always the case. Because as you start to add it in, you'll actually get that cream. Because let's say you drank a, a tablespoon of cream. What's it going to taste like? It's not going to be ice cream. It's not going to be that delicious flavor that you associate with whipped cream. It's going to be a very thick coating going down your throat into your mouth. And it's not going to really be a real pleasant sensation after you're done eating it. So when you use too much cream, that's basically the same thing you're going to do with the soup. It's not really going to give it that real pleasant. Now, instead of the broth, I could have used milk. If you want to use uh, non-fat milk at that stage or 1% milk at that stage, you could. Or if you want to use half milk and half stock, that's okay too. So, you know, either way you want to do it is fine. Have fun with it. And like I said, now, I could have, I also have, let me show you this real quick. I have a tool that I love. I think I may have shown it once or twice before. But this is an immersion blender. All right? So this little baby, when you plug it in, and you turn it on, these little blades in the bottom, it's like a portable blender. I think a chef could be dangerous with that. Well, let me tell you, I had, <laughs> one, I had one that was taller than me that I needed a ladder to use. Wow. The big, the big stock pot, because we had one of these huge <laughs> um, cookers. And it was, it's, we had to hang it up. It was actually about this big. It was amazing. But that, like say I wanted to puree everything in here and then strain it, and have a very smooth yes. soup, I could do that. I would hit it with, a, with the um, immersion blender and just blend it all up. I use that with canned beans lots of times and use them as thickeners because then my wife can't see that there's beans in there <laughs> when I'm making a regular soup. So then it's really like a silk, real silky texture. Yeah, and it thickens it up. You know, like there's some natural thickeners. Uh, uh, okra is a really good natural thickener if you're making a vegetable soup. Like I said, if you have leftover mashed potatoes, throw them in the freezer, dump them in your, let them thaw. You know, I'm not telling you to put them all in frozen. If it's a stock soup, you can throw regular veggies in there. And tomatoes, too. Like if you have cut tomatoes or tomatoes that are getting weepy, freeze them. Soup. You know, really, that's, that's what it, it is. If you like grains, throw some of your favorite grains in there, lentils, you know, or wonderful brown rice, got to cook it a little bit longer. Wow. I mean, when I think of how much food, you know, I throw out, and I'm sure many families throw out, I, it can just be reused and in a delicious, delicious way. I think I'm going to get more Ziploc bags. Well, that's it. You know, and, and if you don't want to, you know, if you don't want to spend money using Ziplocs, then save some of your little plastic containers the food comes in that you can dump in there and freeze. You know, just don't keep them in there for months at a time so it's all freezer burned and, and ruined. You know, keep it towards the front where you can see it. And just say, you know, Saturday night is soup night. 
you know, it was always uh, like, what do we have? What do we have going bad? Not going bad, but what do we have that's not really great that we can make soup out of? You know, that was always what you look for. All right, what can't we use anymore? What has made its way uh, around enough that we can't use it anymore? Now, sometimes you get vegetables that are just shot. I'm not telling you to save them. Uh, if they are really stayed hot too long and they got all mushy and flavorless, you know, maybe you don't want to use them. And once they're cooked, I wouldn't save them for stock anymore because you've cooked the flavors that you want out of them. So. Hmm. Great, excellent tips. Do you want to go through? I have a few uh, sure. comments. You want to go through? Absolutely. Carol, Carol White says yes, very simply. Yes, fat is the flavor. Yeah. There you unfortunate, go. unfortunate as it may seem, there's flavor in fat. Yep. And and you know what? It's it bears repeating. It bear a lot of this bears repeating. A lot of these tips are so basic and simple that really bear repeating. And Nazim says beef stock and ravioli. Had it last night. You were talking earlier about stocks and how yep. flavorful they are. Yep. Uh, you know, simple and elegant, uh, maybe with some cheese. What more do you need? Uh, Jennifer Steele, such great tip, Chef Dennis. To not let anything go to waste, love it. And I knew we would find out all about that today. And you really just seem to take that concept off and, and run with it. I can see the passion uh, behind the show in a lot of ways. Well, soups were always one of my favorites to make. It was, and it was, it was always like a challenge. You know, how can I make it really taste good? You know, some of the best reactions to food I ever got. I remember taking it to my neighbor one time, and her knees buckled. I went, oh my God, are you all right? She goes, oh, that was better than anything I've had in a long time. So those are the reactions you want. Sometimes you get them with soups. Yeah, it, it's amazing the flavors. Now, again, very big tip. I'm going to make the soup, like say I made it tonight. It's not going to taste as good tonight as it's going to taste tomorrow. Oh, okay. So that's the same as, uh, you know, chilies and stews and even even casserole dishes and things like that. The flavors build as it sets. Like when I make, if I made a soup, usually I would make them at work and I would make you know these big five gallon buckets and they would sit and as they sat, and once they cooled off, as they sat in the walk-in in these big buckets, they would start to mature, the flavors would start to build. So by the second day, they were much better. By the third day, they were really, really good soups. And you know, with a, like even French onion, it takes two days to make a really good French onion soup. Uh, it, it takes time to build those flavors. They're complex. But with a, you know, I'm not saying not to eat it tonight, but I'm just saying make enough so you have enough to freeze. And don't rush to put it in the freezer the same day. Let it sit out for a day before you put it in the freezer and then freeze it. Uh, let it build some flavors. When I make marinara sauce, it stays in my refrigerator for three days before I freeze it. I, I'll, I'll put it in the little, the little containers and get it ready because I make enough so I don't have to make it for a month at a time. Uh, I, it just it and it stays in there and it's, it's you know that that's those are you know these tips also fall into uh, the, our busier lives in the fall and how to plan ahead and I find that I eat well the most when I plan ahead mm -hmm. you know so when you put these vegetables away and you make enough sauce and when I make double triple batches of meatballs which I'm famous for <laughs> in my house, then, you know, it, then you can eat well more frequently. Yeah, and it's not like you, everybody has those days. I certainly have them. I come home and I'm just dead. You know, even I, I haven't left home. I haven't left the computer all day. So I haven't thought about, you know, as Lisa says, what do, what do we have? And I go, uh, we got spaghetti. She goes, oh, that's fine. So, you know, that's like my fallback. And we'll have it twice a week because we like it. And, you know, we don't plan to have it. It was like, it's never like we're going to have spaghetti tonight. It's always like, well, okay, I'm tired. It's either go out or I'll eat pasta. <laughs> so then it's a different kind. So then you change that up with different shapes. You know, maybe I'll throw some ricotta cheese and bake it, you know, or I'll do something else with it. But, you know, there's still room to go. It's just I've taken some of the work out of it. And so with these soups, when you cut your vegetables, like I said, if you froze them and have them ready, Maybe you got a part of a leftover roast, or you you bought a chicken at uh you know one of my favorite places to buy roast chicken is Sam's Club. 
they are the most flavorful and they're like six dollars and you know you take that what's left over and make a soup out of it. That's that. funny my son swears by the meat at Costco and he always comes home he does he's a big Costco shopper and he always comes home uh, also with a roasted chicken. The roasted chicken Costco's are very good too and they're very inexpensive you, know, you get them at a grocery store they're gonna they're good but they're gonna cost you two or three dollars more so I'm, I'm talk about being able to feed yourself you can have a nice meal with the chicken and then take that carcass throw that in water and boil it down some more and get all the rest of that little meat and fat off of it that you can and use that as a stock for your soup yep and another uh, comment let's see from Jennifer Steele wow never knew you could use the onion skins for vegetable stock I never knew that either I will bet you most of our uh, viewers did not know that that just makes perfect sense you know growing That's up it. in an era where we had uh, stock pots and kitchens you don't see them anymore because there's just the time involved in it and, and time is money you don't see them but in the era of that I mean oh, if I had you know, I'm, I'm gonna make French onion soup so I'm gonna cut up 50 pounds of onions so all those ends all those skins if I threw them away my boss would have gone ballistic because if I'm roasting prime ribs I need something to put under it so if I cut up fresh wow. onion, if I cut up fresh carrots to throw underneath of it and celery he's gonna go nuts but if I'm using the whole end of the celery you know that base if I'm using all the leaves and, and I don't put celery leaves in the soup years ago a guy told me says they make soup bitter and whether they do or not that went in my head and I'd never put the leaves in the soup some recipes you see and tells you to use the leaves too but I just don't do it but I mean all those scraps we whenever I roast a meat they went under the meat okay the juices would cook down on top of it and through it so now when I lift that roast out or that prime rib out or whatever I was cooking that chicken I've got all my pan and I'll add some water to it and put it back on the stove and I'll get all the juices everything unstuck from the pan well that's my pan sauce that's my pan. Wow. that is amazing that is perfect well that that's why you use them yeah I mean this one show on soups who knew uh, you know from the fundamental of, of chopping to you know saving every little bit and and why and how it, it, it was terrific so show so what's next you show us what you have there well that's it I mean like I said this okay. I, I'm not gonna eat this tonight Lisa's actually away she's in Philadelphia so I, I'm gonna thin this out a little bit more I'm gonna put some vegetable stock and I didn't make my vegetable stock ahead of time all I used was the corn and let me, let me taste it too just to see where it's at. I have a spoon here. Okay. But it's, now those carrots aren't cooked, so. Oh yeah, they're cooked. They are? Oh yeah. They're. Thing to remember we have teeth. Right. Everything doesn't have to be mushed yet. We're going to get to that point in our life sooner or later. But right now we still have teeth. Uh, the carrots actually, they were small enough that they cooked up pretty fast. Potatoes aren't quite done. Okay. So the potatoes need to cook a little bit more. But this is this is not quite done. It needs to have a little more stock in it. It needs to simmer for a little while. Okay, so how did it taste? It was, it, I could taste the corn and that's what I wanted to see. Yeah. So I could take now I could have cooked more corn. Like if you if you do corn and you have those husks, I'm not telling you to freeze them, but maybe you want to make a corn chatter when you have them. Save those husks that you've cut, not that you've eaten, not the ones you've all eaten at the table. <laughs> but but if you're doing fresh corn on you know, sauteing fresh corn, or if you're making a corn relish or something with the corn, save those husks, make a little corn stock with them. And, and use it uh, in a soup if you're going to do that. Oh man, there's so many jokes about the family <clears throat> putting together all their corn husks. The family that you know eats corn chowder together, you know, does everything together. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. We've gone over time, but uh, and I hope you yep. forgive us. Uh, it was it, I didn't think it was going to take this long. Honestly, I thought it was going to be a quicker show, but. Uh, it was a lot. We covered a lot. We so. sure did. We sure could. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for hanging in there and and what a what a wonderful dish. Thanks, Chef. And uh, I'll see you all next Monday. We'll have something. Uh, we'll start yeah. delving into maybe some of the fall things for us to make. Harvest. Harvest. Harvest time. Harvest time. I'll see you all later. Bye. Bye bye.